just wanted to say a bit about vertebrate. They've got a really great publishing list um, about walking and climbing and the wild. And we did an event with them last year uh, around their award-winning book, Waymaking, which is about women and the outdoors. And it's recently won the Banff Award, um, which is a really prestigious award in that field. Um, so we're really pleased to continue that um, relationship with vertebrate. So without further ado, I'd like you to put your hands together for John Burns. Now then, uh, <laughs> it would probably help you to know where I've just come from. Uh, yesterday, hard to believe though it may be, I was uh, right on the far north of Scotland. Um, about as many miles as you can think of from the nearest road, at the edge of a bog, lying in a pile of sheep poo, <laughs> peering over the edge of a cliff with a pair of binoculars. That is how glamorous the life of a wildlife writer is. <laughs> but um, I was looking, however, I was watching uh, some seals feeding their pups on the beach below. And that, that made it all worthwhile. Although I am beginning to think I probably should have changed my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take this off, I'll get rid of that. Um, so we're in, we're in Nottingham, I remembered, <laughs> we're, in, we're in Nottingham, uh, in the city centre here, but I want you to remember, or I want you to imagine, go on and say you're alright, I want you to imagine that we're not here, we're somewhere very different, we're in a bothy on the north coast of Scotland, right in the far north, how many folk here have been to a bothy? Any Bothyists? Oh, there's a few. Good, good, okay. It'll be easier for you. You'll be able to do it. Right. Imagine that we're in this old cottage. And we've walked a long way to get here, so we're wet and we're tired. And we've lit a fire that's smoulder and smoking away. And above the fire is a wee line, and hanging from that are several pairs of wet socks. I would suggest that you don't try and imagine the smell. <laughs> now, if you've not been to a bothy, for those of you who've not been, there's remote shelters in uh, Scotland. There's some in England, but mostly in Scotland. And um, there, there's, there's no running water, there's no power, there's no uh, internet, uh, there's no heating other than what you can carry in. Uh, so it's a bit, if you can imagine it, you have to get there with all your coal and your fire or whatever, create the sort of spark it all up and light some candles. It's a bit like taking a holiday into the 14th century. <laughs> well, these are the sort of places that, 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 that I visit that I, that, and, that, and that I go to. Uh, and as I say, there are wild sort of areas. I've spent my life traveling these places. And I wanted to take, so I want to take you, if you'll come, on a little journey. That journey starts in, 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 that, in that bothy. Um, it's a reasonable journey, reasonable distance, I suppose. Um, and it'll only take us 40 years. <laughs> so I'm hoping you've not got any plans later <laughs> on, you know? People have been asking me why I'm attracted to wild places. What got me into that? Um, I've been trying to think, really. <laughs> But it goes back, I think, I, I was brought up in Merseyside and one of my earliest childhood memories was I was fast asleep in bed and I felt was shaking, my father was waking me up. I must have been about five maybe. And he picked me up, wrapped me in a blanket and took me downstairs um, in the darkness. It felt like the middle of the night, maybe midnight or 3 a.m. Probably about half past seven, you know. <laughs> and he pushed open our front door. And there, outside, our little suburban garden had been transformed into this snowy wilderness. The, it had been taken like to, into a place like Narnia. The, the ice crystals glinting in the, in the, in the, in the lamplight. And that, that snow, that transformation, sort of got into my blood. It sort of, it sort of infected me there. And so I've been attracted to wild places ever since. What my dad also did was, he used to read at night to me in bed. 
and he'd read the poems of Robert Service about wild and lonely places. I think he was trying to turn me into a, a polar explorer. <laughs> or he might have been just trying to get rid of me, I'm not too <laughs> sure which. But I've always liked those poems of Robert Service. They transport me to different places. So I'd like to maybe recite one of them to you. This is the men who don't fit in. There's a race of men who don't fit in. A race that can't stay still. So they break the hearts of kith and kin and they roam the world at will. They rave the field and they rove the flood and they climb the mountain's crest. For theirs is the curse of the gypsy blood and they don't know how to rest. If they just went straight they might go far for they are bold and strong and true. Yet always they tire of the things that are, and they crave the strange and new. They say, if I could just find my groove, what a mark I'd make. So they chop and they change, and each fresh move is only a fresh mistake. And each forgets as he strips and runs at a brilliant, fitful pace. That it's the slow, steady, plodding ones who win the lifelong race. And each forgets that his youth has fled, forgets that his prime has passed, until he stands with a hope that's dead in the light of the truth at last. He has failed. He's just done things by heart. Life has been a merry joke for him, and now it's time to laugh. Ha, ha. He's one of the legions lost. He was never meant to win. He's a rolling stone, and that's bread in the bone. He's the man who won't fit in. And I've been doing this for um, 40 years, and I wondered, you know, what, what? What have I got out of 40 years? So I've made a wee list of what I think I've managed to achieve. Um, so in all that time of wandering the hills, uh, 40 years I've been through 17 pairs of boots, <laughs> 49 blisters, I've been soaked to the skin on approximately 275 occasions, I've fallen over, bruised my knee, on 32 occasions, that's not including coming home from the pub, of course. <laughs> I've been frightened out of my wits on at least 62 occasions. I've fallen off 56 times, a total distance of 272 feet. And I estimate that I've climbed somewhere in the region of 529,000 feet. If I'd kept going, instead of going up and coming down, I'd now be orbiting the Earth about 300 miles above it. <laughs> what have I got to show it? I've got a pair of knackered knees. Um, I've got the certain knowledge that everything looks really tiny when you're high up. Um, and I've also been bitten by 222 million midges. <laughs> Although that was only last <coughs> week in Morgan. So I've got all that to show for it. And... So, I sort of been introduced to the outdoors by my dad and uh, his, 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 uh, his Robert Service poems. And then, uh, my, my first real trip to the mountains, I was at secondary school. And this is years ago. This is the days when, when uh, school teachers used to give up their time and take you into wild places and on holidays. And this is the time you could do that without people thinking you were a paedophile, you know. <laughs> it was a different, a different world then. And... Uh, we were taken on a, a walking holiday to the Lake District and we climbed on uh, outside of our, our school. We climbed on uh, this old bus as it would be now, all chrome and sort of... The, in those days, buses stank of smoke. You could smoke <coughs> on the bus, you know? It was amazing. We didn't smoke on the bus. But I, I sat at the front, but the bad lads sat at the back so they could, they could, they could wave to all the, uh, the drivers behind. Anyway, we got to the Lake District and I couldn't believe this place. Um, my dad <clears throat> had given me, uh, bought me a pair of proper climbing britches, you know, sort of Ellis Brigham 
we'd gone to. And uh, these things, you could get up Everest in these things, were brilliant. Unfortunately, this was July. <laughs> <laughs> But I wasn't going to take these britches off, because these were my, my, the best career of mountaineering britches in the whole school. Uh, so I sweated for about the first day and a half, <clears throat> until I'd lost about a stone, and I decided I'm going to have to uh, take these off. But what I saw in the Lake District, what I found there, was this incredible place where you could see for miles rolling hills, it felt wild, it felt different. And in Merseyside, you know, it's a small place, it's... it's heavily industrialised, it's very heavily built on, and everywhere I go in the Lake District, I was used to seeing signs, no trespassing, can't go here. But in the Lake District, it seemed to me you could go everywhere, and it was a wonderful place. So that, that sort of inspired me. Then the next, the next holiday we went on, a year later, we decided to walk the Pennine Way. Now, uh, we didn't have any gear, we didn't have any of what we would describe today as equipment, uh, I didn't have a waterproof, really. I had a Packamac, and we had a, a, our tent was like uh, two bed sheets stretched over uh, two poles and, and held up by uh, uh, cotton reels at the top. I'm not sure what the cotton reels were for, to be quite honest. But uh, they see we didn't have a ground sheet or anything like that. We just didn't, didn't bother with stuff like that. Um, and my mate didn't have boots. He had, he had uh, what they call tough leather shoes. Both the, the manufacturers boasted that these shoes were, were great in any environment. I don't think they envisaged the Ben Iron Way when they mm. said that. <laughs> so we set off, and of course it peaked and it rained. And on our way up, we stayed in a few youth hostels. Well, in those days, uh, the youth hostels were, were populated by uh, a race of people uh, who were um, youth hostel wardens. And they were made of a, they were a different breed apart, these people. Their whole purpose in life was to wreak terror on <laughs> the inhabitants who came and stayed with them. <clears throat> Remember one warden, great big broad shoulders, huge moustache. She was an impressive woman, I'm telling you. <laughs> and uh, okay, there were rules everywhere, you know. You, these spoons went there, those spoons went there. Big lists everywhere, you know. And in those days, there was some... Uh, there were the belief that, that, that if it was hot, you suffered from salt deficiency. That seems to have become a myth now. But I remember the warden standing up, re in the <coughs> thing that she was, and tapping on the glass in the in the in the refectory. You know, ding, 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 just like that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, she said, "Now then, some of you will be drinking back water. Don't be doing that. We'll be taking." These salt tablets. It's all right. So what we did was, we uh, ate these salt tablets that would keep us refreshed or, or fit or healthy, but we weren't allowed to drink the water. So the effect of that was, the more we wandered, we were wandering around crazed with thirst, <laughs> but not able to drink anything. I'm sure it did us a lot of good. And so, the, 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 these... Uh, so my, my poor old mate, you know, after she stood up and said this, there was a big sign, it said, it said, uh, food, uh, sorry, not food, uh, pans must be washed instantly, immediately after use. So my mate went up <laughs> to do, 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 Does that mean that um, <coughs> we've got to let the food go cold while we wash the pans? And the glare this woman fixed him with, you know? Immediately means immediately. <laughs> well, that was it. <laughs> so in my in my wanderings, we got increasingly interested in the outdoors, and um, I made my way. Our first holiday after that, we'd walked almost to Scotland, walking up the Pennine Way, and so our next trip was to Scotland itself. And I'd never been to Scotland. I'd heard. The, the Scots could be a bit ferocious, you know. So I went to my first trip to Scotland was a place called Glencoe. Some of you must have been to Glencoe. Anyone been to Glencoe? Yes, yeah, a few. Lot of you all been to Glencoe. <laughs> it was a bus trip, wasn't it? <laughs> so oh, I got to Glencoe and I couldn't believe the mountains that surrounded the place. Huge, great cliffs and great edifices that, that, that arise above it. Um, but I'd hitchhiked up and I went into the Clack Egg Inn, which sits uh, at the end of 
and then I wanted to get something to eat. Now in those days, this is the days when, when uh, pretty well everything was formica. I don't know, the, the people were made out of formica, you know, it was, it was everywhere. Uh, but I heard that, 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 that I was a bit, a bit in trepidation really about going in. I go in, and this is where I had a few problems with the language barrier. Standing behind the counter was this great ginger monster. You know, huge beard, he's got, he's got death and, and no surrender tattooed across his forehead. And he's standing there and I felt about, about that, that big, roughly, you know. And I said to him, have you, have you got any food? This guy looks at me and says, we've, uh, we've poisoned Brideys. <laughs> Boys and brides, you know. So that maybe this was some test of your manhood. You know? <coughs> I he ate the poison bride and lived. So I tried. So I thought, well, this can't be right, you know. So I, thought, I, I said to him, well, um, have you got any brides that aren't poisoned? <laughs> <laughs> and he, this time, he, at this point, he became a small bird. He said, wait, 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 and the bloke next to us fell about helplessly with laughter <laughs> and he said what he means is I think you'll find he's got pies and brideys <laughs> which weren't poison <laughs> I discovered discovered to my cost you know so we moved up to Scotland so eventually I moved up to Scotland so I started wandering about the hills there uh, I became uh, fascinated by snow and ice again what, what my dad had done to me you know really marked me for life so I became a, a, a snow and ice climber and wandered over Ben Nevis and places like that and spent my time in, in all of these, these, these kind of places. And it was incredible. Um, and that was my life then, really. I, I, I rushed about doing all these kinds of things, great climbs. But gradually, as I've got older, things have changed a bit, you know. Um, I've got... I've, I kind of feel I've done some of those things to death and I, I want to do something, find something different. And I've gradually got interested, more and more interested, in, in going, visiting Bothies and places like that. Now the Bothies that I go to, there are, there are really remote places, amazing places to go to, I think. Um, and there's, 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 there's several of them that, 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 that I think would be, you'd like to know about. Um, one place, there's a place called Geldershiel. Uh, Geldershiel is a, a, a wee bothy on the Queen's Balmoral estate. And Geldershiel sits there, it's a little, little cottage, if you like, one room cottage. And opposite Geldershiel is um, a, 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 a bigger cottage. Now, the bigger cottage is where the Queen apparently goes to have a cup of tea now and again, you know, and a wee biscuit. Um, but years ago, uh, a mate of mine turned up there, Davy, a great big Abedonian. And Davy goes there, and uh, he notices that the skylight is open on the Queen's cottage. Now, Davy, being a climber and being curious, decides he'd climb on the roof, <coughs> and he opened the skylight. And he looked down, and there he was looking down into the Queen's bathroom. There was a toilet <laughs> below him, you know. Fortunately, the Queen was not sitting on it at the time. But Davy, being, being curious again, Decides, right, I'll go and explore a bit. So he, he, he swings down, he lowers himself down from the window and drops into the bathroom. And as I look around, he smells the Queen's soap, uses the Queen's toilet. Well, you know, not many of us can claim that our backside has touched the same wood as Her Majesty, you know. Uh, and then he starts, he, say, he decides, well, I, I think I'll go home now. So he looks up and he realises he can't reach the window. So he gets on the toilet, he stands up, he still can't reach it. So he thought, well, I'll just go out the door and find my way out. Mm. Goes to the door, the door's locked. This big glass door is locked. So he says, what am I going to do? I'm trapped in the Queen's bathroom. It's not a good place to be, you know. And he notices that there's a huge Victorian, you know, these marble washstands. <coughs> Jane, well, well, Davy's a big guy. And Davy picks up this wash down, he heaves it, and then he throws it through the wind, through the door, smashes the door wide open, and makes his escape. <laughs> if you go to Geldershiel now, you'll find that there's uh, satellite security all around it. I think that's down to Davy. 
But mm. also, another little story about Geldershiel. Apparently, the Queen went. This is apparently the Queen went there one day to the cottage, and she got curious about this bothy next door. So she goes over and has a look round, and of course, it's been used by climbers. It's full of there's all bits of cans of beer and fag ends all over the floor. You know, it's a bit of a dump, really. And uh, so she gets a broom and she swoops up the floor. Uh, and one of the ladies in waiting and waiting wrote in the, the Bothy's always have a little book, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bothy book. Um, she wrote in the Bothy book, the Queen swept here. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. As I stand here. <laughs> So bothies and, 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 and nature have become part of my life, as much a part of my life as anything else. And also, I, as I say, I was, a, I was a very keen ice climber. And <clears throat> although our, our, we our weather recently, oh, you wouldn't believe it if you actually went to uh, Scotland right now, right now it's pretty cold up there, has been very erratic. So we decided, me and my mate, we would go to Canada, ice climbing in Canada. And we did a few climbs there in various places. Um, but one climb is above Banff. Someone mentioned Banff earlier on. <laughs> it's actually quite close. It's just outside Banff. In Scotland, if you're going to climb ice, normally the ice routes are very, very high on mountains. And it, you, know, you walk for hours to get to the ice route. But in Canada, they've got the right idea. In Canada, You've got an ice climb right behind, behind the local supermarket. It's no, it's no trouble at all. You know, great. But uh, we went on this uh, route called the Cascade, and it was warmer than it normally is, even in Canada. Um, and as we, we climbed up the Cascade, um, we realised the whole thing was melted. It was a bit like a great big lolly ice. It was all uh, hollow and it was all rotting and all running down. So we decided it wasn't a very good idea to climb this thing. But we started to abseil off to the route slide down our ropes and, and get off the route. And, and I've learned a few things since this, right? I was waiting for my mate to come down towards me, just taking in the <coughs> rope and he was coming down. And I looked down and I noticed that um, there was a line of different birds leaving the woods below us. Now, I thought that's a bit strange. I, was, I always thought birds weren't that bright, you know? Turns out these guys knew saying a few things that I didn't know. And I also noticed it suddenly started to go dark. Now this is the middle of the day, it's bright sunlight, it's going dark, something's up. And I turned round, and as I turned round, this huge avalanche swept over and carried my mate away. I was right on the edge of it. It took him right down the, right down the route that we just climbed. And there was great trees and boulders coming with it, and ice and snow. And at that point I was absolutely convinced we were both dead. So I tried to hold him, I, don't know, I, 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 I locked off the belay and tried to hold him with a rope around my body. That is pretty hard to do, I discovered. And as he was going down, carried away in the avalanche, I knew <coughs> that below us there was a cliff. So I thought, I've got to stop him before he goes over the cliff. But I locked off the belay, held on as hard as I could. But it felt to me as though the rope was trying to cut me in half. It was that painful. And I could hear my ribs breaking as it went. And eventually, to my relief, to be honest, the rope snapped. But there's still thousands of tons of rock and ice pouring down on us. And uh, so all I could do was get a, as close as I could to the cliff face to hope to protect me from all this rock and stuff, you know. And it was a weird thing because the huge avalanche came down and then it passed away and it was as if it never happened. There was just... Uh, all the birds came back, the sun came out, but one thing that did remain was that there was a, one of the ropes had held and it just went down to where I thought my friend was hanging dead. And so we were lucky, because as I say, the Canadian ice falls, they put them quite, quite close to the road, they're quite, quite, quite good like that. And one of the rangers, one of the park rangers, had watched the avalanche on the road and drove across to the foot of the climb and see, found our, our vehicle parked there and realised that we must be on this climb that he'd just seen avalanche. So he radioed in to his control room and within only a few minutes they came back with a helicopter and the helicopter 
took my friend off and on a, he was in my friend was had swung round fortunately underneath an overhang and had been protected from the mo from the from most of the uh, of the avalanche so he was still alive but he was injured so they took him off on uh, this stretcher and they took him away and then they came back for me i wasn't injured or well, was injured a bit but not broken a hand and nothing nothing of any great consequence now I was, as I think someone said, in the mountain rescue team, and I was used to being uh, winched into helicopters in, 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 in Scotland. That was something I did quite a bit. Um, and so I thought, well, no problem at all. So the, the guy lowered me a rope, I clipped that in, then much to my amazement, rather than hauling me off, this little helicopter took off down the valley. <laughs> <laughs> and I realised, in a moment, that rope was going to go tight. And that isn't going to be something you're going to enjoy. And it, well, it wasn't. It catapulted me off into, into midair, and I had the longest helicopter ride of my entire existence, hanging with about 2,000 feet below me. You sort of know the rope's not going to break, but you kind of <laughs> you have to have a lot of faith in that. <laughs> so, so that was our our, our Canadian ad adventure, and. Uh, it put my mate off ice climbing, I can't understand why. <laughs> he didn't do much after that, but I persisted, kept climbing for years after that. But in recent years, I've got, become to know the, the mountains a lot better. Um, I've become interested in the wildlife that lives there. Uh, I used to consider the, the mountains were something to be run up and ticked off and, and just done. I would have climbed these various routes, but I never, I never really paid that much attention to the environment that was there, to, to, to the, the actual, uh, to, to the na natural world. But I've become more interested in that. And part of that goes back, I think, to um, an experience I had of seeing various wild animals in the wild. I have this theory that, 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 that there's not anywhere truly wild in the British Isles anymore. Um, but now and again you catch sight of an otter or you might catch sight of a pine martin. And those, those glimpses to me are, I would like to call them glimpses of wildness. Because these are creatures that live in the wild. They experience it. And so, so we can experience some of that if we look for it. And I was walking in the highlands in, in the winter and it was the, the snow had, had, had fallen fairly recently, and it was light and fluffy. And it, what it did was, it meant that as I was walking, I was fairly silent in my footsteps. And a little stoat, a little tiny creature, danced up, came out of the side of the snow and started dancing about in front of me. And you know, stoats, they, 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 their coat turns to ermine in the winter. Not all stoats do that, but no one really knows why. But this was a little white creature. And the one bit of it that, that remained black was the tip of its tail. And I could see it dancing about. And because it couldn't hear me, it didn't know I was there, which is very rare for a stoat, because they're pretty sharp. Um, and then, after a few minutes, it, it suddenly turned around and did a, sort of, did a sort of double take, saw me, and fled off. But that, that glimpse of that wild creature kind of stayed with me, kind of pulled me back and started got me thinking about well, what else lives here, what else can I actually see um, and more recently I've seen uh, hen harriers flying in the wild, very, uh, quite a rare bird, it shouldn't be a rare bird here but it is uh, and they're still not that common in the highlands but this well, hen harrier was hunting, the way hen harriers hunt they, 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 they fly low over the ground uh, because, they're, they're, as I say, they're, they're a misnomer. They should really be called vole harriers because they're actually hunting for voles and not hens because you won't find many hens in the island. But uh, that's what they've become known. And they're a rare sight. And so I was going to this, to, I, I go back to but these bothies continually, places I, I get to know them. Now, uh, my friend and I, who did the Pennine Way, still occasionally going to Bothy's together. And there, I have to say, occasionally, whiskey is drunk. And uh, this is sometimes a bad idea. Uh, because we decided that we would, that, that, that we would re, we would do the Pennine Way again 40 years later. Now then, <laughs> they may tell you that age is just a number. Well, I can tell you, 40 years is a long time, 
and uh, I can still walk 24 miles in a day uh, and possibly do maybe the same distance the following day but the third day I have to have a day off <laughs> I can't do it anymore uh, so we attempted the Pennine Way again and looking at that landscape again reminded me of, uh, of things I've learned a lot about about landscape about, about our rights or access the Pennine Way took many years to come into being it was the first long distance footpath of its tar of, of, it, of its type and it uh, encountered a lot of opposition from landowners it actually took an act of parliament i believe to actually bring that path into into being um and the re and it, it made me think about the rights that we have as, uh, as, as people to wander on the hills. And we kind of think that these rights were given to us uh, and have always been around, that we've always been entitled to do that. But particularly in England and also in Scotland, that's far from the case. And our rights to actually, our right to one of these hills was earned and was fought for many years ago. And I'd like to... Before I, 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 what I'd like to do is, I'd like to tell the story of the Kinder Trespass, which was uh, a mass movement to help people like you and I get the rights to wander on the moor, on moorland. So I've got this is a little one-man play, I guess you'd have to call it, about the Kinder Trespass. It happened in. Uh, 1934, when thousands of men came back from serving in the trenches of the First World War. They came back to work in the industrial towns of Northern England. Places like Sheffield, Leeds and Manchester. Places where the air was thick with smoke. Where the buildings were stained black with soot and where the only sound was the throbbing of the machines. In Sheffield, they made steel and turned it into pots and pans and cutlery. In Leeds, they wove woolen cloth. But in Manchester, cotton was king. In only 40 years, the city had grown to four times its previous size. There were 60 cotton mills with thousands of men and women working long hours and coming home to sleep in small overcrowded back-to-back -back houses. Aye. Uh, you have to watch these looms on those, eh? <laughs> Can I take your eyes off them? 12 hours a day I work here. Adjust the tension. Control the settings. Gaffer says, Keep on running smooth, Rothman. If you cannot do it, there's plenty as will. Aye. And he's right too. Oh, bugger. Every now and again, the thread breaks. 12 hours a day I work here. <coughs> At home, my ears full of the sound of the machines, stinking of oil. <laughs> my dad said, I've got it easy. He went to the war, you see. He came back less an arm. Says as how he was one of the lucky ones. Ah, he's right too. Running smooth, Mr. Arkwright! Six days a week, I work here in this factory, minding these looms, keeping it running smooth. But I've got Sundays off. Ah, <laughs> I made my centre bike. I made it out of bits and pieces I found lying around. Me and my mates were all members of the Communist Party Sports League. We cycle out into Derbyshire and we get right up on the moors. Oh, I wish you could see us all marching and singing. We go to places like Edale, <coughs> Hope, Haworth, 
And we walk on places like White Moss, Kinder Scout, Bleaklow. Oh, places where the air is fresh and smells clean. It smells of, it smells of water and sheep and <laughs> I guess it smells of freedom. Any man, no matter what pressures, what problems weigh down on him, can walk on those moors and feel that freedom blowing against his face. Keep it going, Mr. Arkwright, all right here. <laughs> my body's here, in this mill. But in my mind, I wander out of Edale. And I can follow the Grinds Brook out through the meadow. First it's slow and gentle like, and then the hill steepens and it starts to babble and tumble and sparkle. And then higher, higher still, it's just a trickle right on the summit. And I can stand there and I can see. I can see right across the whole world. Don't tell Mr. Arkwright though, eh? <laughs> it's Sunday! Come on then, lads. Come on, Jack, you'll have to keep <coughs> up. It's all that tetley ale that sups. We get the train. The house. Walk out of the station and up onto the hill, round past the reservoir. And there, they're waiting for us. Gamekeepers. Eight of them. Hey you! You have no right here! Get that set away! We're just working men like you. We just want to walk on these hills. We're doing no harm. We're doing no harm, mate. Let us pass. This land belongs to the Duke of Devonshire. It's not for the likes of you now, I won't tell you again. They come at us with boots and fists. Something catches me on the side of the head. It goes dark. Oh, don't fuss. I'm all right. We can't stand. We can't stand for this. Comrades, all we want at the end of the working week is to be able to wander these moors, to take us in some fresh air and feel the sunlight. How can it be right for one man to own these hills and keep them for himself so him and his friends can go shooting there a few <coughs> times a week. Who owns the wind? Who owns the hills? Who owns the sunlight? Who owns the bird song? Who's with me? My uh, family has owned this land for 280 years. Yet now, these communists, these factory workers, seem to think that they can wander my land as they wish. Mark my words. If we allow this, they will be walking through our homes, taking all that we possess from us. We must stop them. We come back Derbyshire. We climb on the train, but there's not just half a dozen of us this time. Oh no, there's some lasses from the dye works. There's some blokes from the bicycle factory. There are 400 of us this time. We're all singing and chanting. And we arrive at the station. The police are waiting for us, ready with their truncheons. 
Nine lads. Look. We're peaceable. We keep ourselves within the law. They cannot stop us. We get off the train. They're pushing us down the platform. But we keep going. We march out to the station and up onto the hill, past the reservoir again. And there they are, ready for us again. But these aren't keepers. These are toughs. The Duke of Devonshire's hired. They're standing there, bar in the way. That's no violence. They can't stop us this time. We march up to them. Just pushing, shoving. Suddenly someone throws a punch, down goes one of the keepers. We march on past them, they cannot stop us, there's too many of us. We walk up the hill, right to the summit of Kinder Scout, and there coming towards us are the Sheffield contingent. They've walked 20 miles to be here, come all that way. We sit down, we have a bottle of beer, some sandwiches, we're singing. Now it feels like we own the hill. I never thought I'd see this. We're happy going down. Walk back down to the station. But when we get down to the village, the police are waiting for us. They push us into a little square, all jostling and crowding together. Big sergeant gets up, opens a proclamation. I commandeth that entreateth all those here to disperse and return to your rightful homes <coughs> and places of domicile by the order of King James under threat of prison. God save the King! Big Sergeant comes over. Now then lads, look. That's made that point, eh? You go off down that ginnel, and we'll say no more about it. All right. We go off down this, down this little alleyway. <laughs> we believed it. We walk around the corner, and they're waiting for us, the police. They arrest us. Take us down, and we, send, we spend the night in the cells. Judge, in the morning. Stands there. Benjamin Rothman, you are charged that on the 14th of April 1934 you did trespass on the land of the Duke of Devonshire and there take part in an unlawful gathering. What do you plead? What have you to say for yourself? He is the Duke's cousin. I know what's going to happen. But I'll not let him do it without having my say. My lord, all we want to do is, at the end of the working week, just, just walk on these hills, get some fresh air. We mean no <coughs> harm, we'll do no damage. Surely that's not unreasonable. Reasonable or not, it is not for you to decide who walks on that land. Six months. Sorry. The Strange Ways prison. Every day is the same. Sometimes, when it's clear, I could look out of the window, right across the grey slate roofs of the town, and out to Derbyshire, the green hills in the distance. Sometimes I feel that we've wasted our time here. And one day, Warder brings a letter in from a lady in Halifax. Said how we shouldn't be in here for this. Next day, there's two letters. Soon, they're bringing big bags of letters in. Next I hear, there are questions in the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> Soon. There's another march on Kinderscout, but it's not 400, it's 10,000. And after what Benny did, it took years, it took 20, 30 years, but now we have these rights of access. 
and we can walk where we want to. We can experience the light on the hills, we can experience that wind. But it all started there, high on that hill, with the wind through the heather. I think if Benny came back today, what changes would he see? Well, I spend my time on the mountains of Scotland. And when I first went there, I saw a wonderful, wild environment. I saw an open countryside that we all could wander. I saw a natural place. But I've learned that since then, that's not what we're looking at. The highlands where I come from have been ravaged by deer hunting, by stalking, overgrazed, the forest destroyed and kept that way for the, the pleasure of a few men who wish to hunt, and it is mostly men. In Scotland, land ownership is concentrated in the hands of about 600 people, more concentrated than probably anywhere else in Europe. Um, and <coughs> other practices that go on, such as driven grouse shooting, do not, driven grouse shooting, for those who don't know, is a practice whereby large areas of land, I'm talking about huge areas, uh, the Highlands is, to give you an idea, the Highlands is the size of Belgium. That only really helps if you know how big Belgium is. <laughs> <laughs> but fair enough, you know, it's a big place, you know, and we don't even know exactly, but somewhere between 16 and 20 percent of the Highlands <laughs> is driven grouse moor. And that's a practice whereby men, and it is mainly men, it is almost entirely rich men, sit in butts like little uh, protective shelters and beaters drive grouse towards them and it's like target practice they shoot thousands of these things and that is considered sport okay you might say well if that's what they want to do what harm does it do the harm that it does is that um, in order to do have an efficient driven grouse shoot you have to have an artificially high number of grouse in the area. It has to be a, a, a population of grouse that the moorland couldn't naturally support. In order to do that, you have to get rid of the raptors. You have to shoot and poison all the other predators that are in there. So that's, that's, that's hen harriers, that's eagles, that's, that's pine martins in some cases. All kinds of... Our wildlife is destroyed there. And what that ends up with is a vast area of moorland that really isn't supporting anything like the kind of life that it, that it should do. Um, driven grouse shooting contributes enormous damage. It damages the peat. You have to burn areas to keep shoots small for, for grouse to feed off. It destroys whole areas of, of our landscape. And yet, it's strange that we, we in, in 2019, okay, Benny fought for our rights to wander these places, but we have no rights to say what happens on these places. And yet, you know, land isn't like, owning land isn't like owning anything else. It's not like, um, it's not like your trousers, right? You own your trousers, very nice bird trousers they are too, right? <laughs> and if you got up in the morning and there was somebody else in your trousers, you'd be able to object, wouldn't you? You'd have something to say, wouldn't you? Right, but land isn't like trousers, okay? It's land is, it, it, these people didn't make this land. They, they didn't build the mountains, they didn't dig the rivers, they were there already. And all that they were able to do, our, our, our land ownership system is positively medieval. Because it goes back to a time really when a load of guys turned up with sticks, and a load of other guys turned up with sticks, and whoever won the pawn shop owned that land. That's, that, that's where land ownership comes from. And now, in 2019, I'm not objecting to what everybody does, but, but it seems crazy to me that the, the land, our country, our country, where we come from, that we are part of, what happens on that land is decided by <clears throat> the outcome of a pawn shop 300 years ago. That's crazy. We should have rights to this land. We should have, be able to decide. Maybe we should, in Scotland perhaps, we could have um, a, a, a plan uh, that designs what happens in various areas. We could rewild these places. Our hills are barren and destroyed. They're not natural. And, you know, they could be covered by forests that could be, that could have links in them, they could have, they could have wolves. Uh, and it could, we, could, we could build a different place, a different Scotland. Uh, and yet our own, we are, we are conned, really, by 
what happened hundreds of years ago into believing that 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 that, that that's the right of things. You know, these people they call they gave themselves names. They called themselves lords and dukes and whatever else it is. And they made themselves sound different from us and they're not. And we're just at the beginning of that. I think we're beginning in Scotland we're beginning to campaign against driven grouse shooting. To to and it should be relegated to the past. It will be banned one day, it will. Whether I'll live to see it, I don't know. But it's all about power. So uh, you can visit websites like Revive's website. You can look at Raptor Persecution Scotland. All these kind of things that tell you the truth about what's going on in our landscape. We have the right to decide what happens to this land, not other people. And so I think it's so. So that's that's what I've learned. I've become, I guess, from when I walked upon. Uh, when I first went to the Lake District, I saw a massive natural landscape. I don't see that now. I see something, but I see something that needs fighting for, and that. That's why um, <coughs> I suppose I was about to say something about my books. Aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> this Glass Hill Walker really is my my memoir of 40 years in the hills. It talks about what I've just gone through with you. Mothy Tales talks about the yarns and the stories and the, the tales that come from, from, from Bothies. And my last book, my most recent book, is called Skydance. And Skydance is a, a fictionalised account of two guys who are mountaineers, hill walkers, who decide to do something about the sort of issues that I've, that I've talked about. And I'm writing a third book now, which is why I was lying in sheep shit <laughs> up in Sutherland. And that is... Uh, called Wild Winter, that's a diary of a winter. Not just of the winter, but of the creatures that inhabit the wild places that I go to. And I want to talk about some of the threats and things, that, the challenges that they face. Um, okay, I thank, thanks very much. I hope you've enjoyed that talk. I think we've got, we're having a five minute break, is yes. that correct? Yep. Five minute break, so use the loo, get, get some more uh, drink down here, and then <laughs> you can come back and ask questions and we can talk about it a bit more. Okay, thank you very much. Go on then, lady. How did you fund oh. your life? Oh, <laughs> oh um, I, 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 I jobs and work, but I, but I was I was I was basically uh, weekends and, and, and every time we've got one. Um, now I'm semi-retired, so I'm doing even more than I used to do. And I, I obviously got income from books, so as long as I write enough about it, I, I can I can I can continue to pursue my lifestyle, you know. <laughs> yes, go on. One of the ways that people have owned land in, in Scotland and elsewhere in the, in the UK is, is by marriage to the aristocracy, who also are involved in government. Yeah. What are your hopes about sort of displacing that, <laughs> particularly in Scotland? Oh, in Scotland, okay. Um, well, um, I think that, that in order to get anywhere with that, we would need to have Scottish independence. I can't see Boris Johnson going along with that, can you? <laughs> um, I, I'm not, per se, against people owning land. But, and I don't have any panacea for this, or any uh, you know, obvious answer really, but I think that um, if you own large parcels of land, then you should, that, what comes with that is a lot of responsibilities. And you should be, uh, what you do with it shouldn't be just up to you. You should have to provide, say, certain areas that are rewilded. It's changing, it is changing. So I, I don't know that you, uh, <coughs> Maybe all land should be nationalised. I don't know, no, but uh, that might be a bit hard to get through, you know. Uh, but but I think that, that but that's the way it should go. I think I think it's totally wrong. What is wrong is that there, there are some good landlords in Scotland. There are mostly not of uh, of Scottish descent, but there are people who come in. But even so, um, it shouldn't be down to the whim of that person who owns that land. What happens to it? Because this this is this is this is this is literally our land. This is our, our home, you know. Just to quickly respond to that, isn't it? There's a difference between owning a little bit of land and owning a yeah. massive amount of yeah. land. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going uh, to. Don't, I don't think there should be any dispute that you got to own your own back garden. That's not a problem. But I think if you own 150,000 acres, that's a bit different. You know what I mean? That, that's what I'm saying. Sorry, you're going to. Yeah, have you had any other life or death experiences on the mountain? <laughs> any other stories? Oh, you know, must just enjoy that story, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, quite a few, really, but uh, not quite as dramatic as that. But, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, I've had quite a few moments like that in different situations. Uh, climbing into uh, places that I shouldn't be, or 
Um, some of the things that I do is to go to very remote places, and sometimes in weather that is probably... I like the winter, it's not always a good time to go to some of these places. Um, and there's, there's oh, a place called um, Glen Cool, and in order to get down to this remote glen, you go over the hill and you come down into it. So I climbed down this hill, uh, and this is, by the time I got into the, the, the valley floor to get to this bothy, it was already dark. And um, so I, I, I got to the river, and the river had swelled up. It, and, I, and by this time, I'd gone down to this glen. Anybody to get home would be to climb the mountain again, and the weather was really wild by this stage. So I had to wade through the river in the dark. <coughs> this is not what an old man should do, is it really? And uh, when I got to the other side of the river, the bank was overhanging in peat, and I couldn't climb out. So I had to go along it. My, one, of my, one of my tips, one of my survival tips, as you see, um, if you're in a, a river in a wild situation like that, I never boulder hop, I never leap from one boulder to another, because if you're on your own and you slip and you break your leg, you're not going to get out that river. <laughs> so be a bit careful with that. I'd rather get wet feet and not break my leg. Um, eventually I got out, and it, it's weird actually. I was walking down the glen, and what happens is deer at night uh, lose their fear. Well, it's not so much they lose their fear of you. The way deer, the way deer actually um, recognise you is they record that it's sort of built into their instinct. They recognise you by your outline. So if, if it's dark and you've just got a head torch on and you move along, they actually can't recognise you as what they're, they're sort of phased by you. Mm. And so the deer weren't really moving out of the way for, for me. And, it, and it's really cool. And I, 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 as I was walking along the path, I could literally smell their breath because they just walked out the way. And I find my way, um, uh, it really sharpens up your navigation. You know, I had to, I had to navigate all my way down to this, the, the, this bothy. And to my delight, this bothy appeared at the end of my head torch, moving towards me. But there was a stag, a great big stag, standing right between me and the door. And I wasn't sure if he was bluffing, but I knew I was. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just moved towards me. Unfortunately, he just stepped aside and let me go in the bothy. Uh, but that's 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 one of the many sort of uh, episodes that I could. I probably should have been drowned, to be honest. <laughs> Anything else? I've silenced you. Courtney, go ahead. Do you still use youth hostels? And if so, have you noticed the difference? <laughs> oh wow. Um, well, youth hostels don't really exist in the way they used to exist. Youth hostels have become. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but youth hostels are now uh, primarily used by older people, and they're mm -hmm. mainly tours, bus tours, that sort of stuff. They don't exist like these. A lot of the youth hostels that I would have used in my youth have closed. Um, you can now, oh, I don't know you could do, but well, it's still true, um, that you could actually get a massage in Patterdale Youth Hostel. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if I had asked that harridan for a massage? I probably would have got one, but I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it. So, so yeah, it's changed radically. Radi radically. They're also very expensive. Are they very expensive? I didn't know because I don't stay in them too often. We did the Coast to Coast a couple of years ago. We stayed in... And it cost you 18, 89. That's because you had the ensuite. No. You had the ensuite <laughs> private room. Yeah, I stay in youth hostels, and they're about ten pounds. Ten pound in the yes. dorm. <laughs> he, 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 he had the massage. Job. <laughs> <laughs> you sleep underground, or you get a sleeping bag. Oh, oh, I sleep in a sleeping yeah. bag. Oh, so you're not in the, oh, yeah. you're on suite. Yeah, they're yeah. on suite. Yeah, we're on suite. <laughs> <laughs> there was a jacuzzi. Okay. <laughs> you don't need a tent or anything. Oh God, you need a tent. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, you can, yeah I, I've camped a lot, and I can, I can go into gear if you want. But 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 uh, <laughs> yeah, you definitely need to have a, a tent. Or you can get sleep beds and just sleep outside in them. Though. Vivian, isn't it? You can. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you can bivy out. It, it, it depends on the on the conditions. It's not bivying out. I've bivied out a few times, but it, it's all right if it's very cold and it's dry. But you don't want to bivy out if it's wet because you will eventually get wet there's no two ways about it and you definitely don't want to baby out if, 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 if it's the midge season <laughs> so they will devour you and make life very unpleasant um, you, one of the great things about bothies is for I mean, I, I, if you've not experienced the highland midge it's, it's, it's like purgatory basically um, uh, 
it can be so bad you can barely breathe. But if you, it, fortunately, for some reason, but midges don't go into bothies. And they don't go into houses very much either. If, if midges went into houses, there would be no one living in the hive. <laughs> it would be empty, I can assure you. Uh, any, any more? Or over here. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Uh, two two questions. It, uh, in winter conditions, do you, do you um, use skins and skis at all, or is it just boot? You know, is it? Plant? I just is use boots. Plant? There, um, uh, there uh, mainly because I was a climber and yeah. uh, I never really mastered skiing. Because I didn't have the time to do both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the if the conditions are right. Snowshoes can be very yeah, good. Yeah, I was going to ask. Um, it, but they have to be, the conditions have to be right for that. Uh, and and some, if you've been deep snow, it's almost impossible to get around without snowshoes sometimes. Yeah. So um, yeah, they have, they have their place definitely. And, and, and certainly in the Cairngorms, places like that, there's quite a lot of people who, who, will, who will use like cross-country skis, things like that to get around. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, think it on the second, on the second question was, was on the on the hen harrier and the eagles and the indigenous yes. wildlife that's that's no longer yeah, yeah. there in the numbers I mean, it, it's what do you think the mileage is for the same kind of rights approach for those creatures as as us creatures as walkers and hikers pioneered when we what kinder a... scout pioneered for a rights approach Yes. No, I think that, that, um, that, that, that's well. It is, the trouble is that we tend to look at everything in terms of the cost, what, the, what, what, what this costs, what that costs. But if you think about it, what, what's, a, what's a hen harrier worth? Hmm. You know, that's a valuable creature. So, so yeah, but yeah, yeah, I can, I can see an appro yeah. approach to that, yeah. The problem and, is they're highly protected species, but you have to, you can have a law, but you need to apply it, don't you, really? <laughs> well, the problem, well, the pro yeah, just to answer that, yeah, the problem is, as you're obviously aware of it, the problem is that, that, that a lot of these animals, hen harriers, eagles, or whatever, by definition, they're in remote areas, there's not many people about, but it could be policed, particularly by drones these days. So there are ways of doing it if we want to. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry then, just the, the point that the, the, um, the law may be in place to protect them, but there's um, a, a additional... Um, Windows for um, I'm trying to think of the right word uh, for for exceptions, so that um, in order to control the numbers, um, you, you license um, culling or whatever you want to call it, um, which uh, doesn't allow the the population to thrive to the extent that it uh, that it can. Uh, sort of, yeah. It's, it's quite complicated. Yeah. One of the, the issue about hen harries, for example, okay is that um, suppose you have in a particular area uh, a driven grouse moor and they will shoot illegally but they will do it mm -hmm. um, or poison or trap or whatever hen harriers the problem with hen harriers is they will range over a huge area so they so uh, one so your, 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 your grouse moor could be over there you, and this could be 70 miles away that your, your hen harrier but your hen harrier comes over is killed and then that creates like a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So effect effectively, someone like a, a grouse moor sucks in raptors, that may, particularly the hen harrier, because it covers a much bigger area than most. It's not as territorial, if that makes sense. Yeah? Uh, but it's quite, it is com it's a complicated question that you've asked, really. I couldn't really answer it in. And I wouldn't pretend to be that sort of an expert, really. One last question, then. OK, there's two questions in one. Two? Oh, <laughs> cheating. No, the first bit, the idea of going off to the wilderness and being watched by drones is a bit of a contradiction, but it wasn't what I was going to ask. The other thing I was going to ask is, uh, I didn't know this was on tonight, so I didn't prepare my question. Oh, right. Sorry about it. If you're, if you're rewilding and you're talking about wolves, can sure. be contentious. And these, if I just say wolves, you've probably got a lot to say. So I've I have. I'll let, let you say it. Also, before you say, I walk with a limp. Does that mean if I go anywhere near a wolf, I'm the first one they're going to take <laughs> It depends if you can run fast on the boat behind you. <laughs> well, well, well you would be a guy, I don't want to go into it. You're right, I don't want to go into it. Wolves have a huge mythology around them. The, the actual risk to human beings from wolves is pretty small. But real? No, I, it wouldn't, I would walk through an area with wolves without even thinking about it. I know, a lot of people would, and they'd be okay, but if I had a limp, would I be alright? Yeah, probably. <laughs> The number of the number of recorded human attacks by wolves is very small, 
and only very occasionally do they dress up as grandmothers. <laughs> <laughs> and then they have rare children. And then they're exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's enough for the right. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Very much.